Firstly, a very warm welcome, if it's your first time with us this morning. Good to have you with us. Um, secondly, Don's, Don Brown's funeral. Uh, some of you will have got the updates in WhatsApp, but let me say a little bit more about that. If you have any questions, please come and talk to me or Marion, and uh, we can give you the information. The date for Don Brown's funeral is Monday the 4th of December. The plan is to have a funeral service at 11.30 at the Vineyard Church, which is at the Allen, near the Richardson Dees Park in the centre of Wall's End. Uh, the service will be about an hour, open to all, and Claire, Don's daughter, has warmly invited all of us to, to come, if you're free. There will then be a burial at Heaton Cemetery at one o'clock. Um, Again, Claire said that's open to all, but probably given the space restrictions at the cemetery, uh, we probably recommend family plus close friends to come to that. And so if you're not coming to that, you can just stay behind in the building. We've booked out the, the Allen for the whole day, so you can stay behind for refreshments. And then when the, the burial party come back to the, the Allen, um, there will then be time to have lunch at, at the wake together. So that's that's the plan there. There's a team of five of us from Hope Church helping the family because, bless them, Rudy and Claire have just moved house and just had the death of Don's, uh, Don's death, a lot to deal with. So we're helping with the, the service and the refreshments and catering and things. There's a team of us at Hope Church coordinating, welcoming, stewarding, catering, um, the service as well. So I'm going to be leading the service and preaching on Philippians 1 verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if you pray for that, pray that um, for all aspects of the funeral, all the practicalities, um, it's great to work in partnership with the Vineyard Church uh, on this. Um, pray particularly for those who are not yet trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ who come to the funeral, uh, that they would hear about Don's faith in Jesus and, and see that that's something that they too can have for themselves by trusting in Christ. And there will also be a collection there for St Oswald's Hospice. So again, if you have any questions, do come and talk to myself or Marion about that. Um, thirdly, the Lertzwap Christmas catalogue is out. So if you prefer, I won't say too much on that, but the details are here. If you want to pick up details, do out in the hallway. And finally, Christmas events. Christmas is coming. <laughs> um, these cards are available, the events are up there. Um, please pray for these events. Um, a variety of us are speaking, so Matthew is speaking at the quiz, um, I'm speaking at a couple of the services, John is speaking at one of the services, Lindsay is speaking at the Reef event, and Julia is speaking at the Toddlers event, so different, and I'm also speaking at the Hope Church Christmas event. Uh, pray for people that we've already invited or that we're thinking of inviting for them to, to come and to be receptive to the message. And particularly pray for the Holy Spirit to be at work. That's the key thing. We can put on events, we can share a message, but we need God the Holy Spirit to bring conviction of sin and of judgment and to draw people to faith in Jesus. So pray, please pray for that. Um, invite, there is still time to take away these cards and invite, or if you prefer electronic WhatsApping people or emailing people, you can do that as well. Take a link on the website, whatever, however you want to invite, it works for you. Uh, make the most of that. And in terms of help, um, one particular request for help is on the, the event on Saturday, the 9th of December, which Julie has organised. That's the kind of Hope Church Christmas party event. And um, Norma, I believe, has a sign-up so, list. The sign-up list, just yeah. Volunteers, yes. Yeah. So, so, so we'll get, yeah. So Norma's got a sheet. Oh, is it, it's out in the hallway, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Okay, she great. Fine, fine, fine. So if you're able to help with any of the practicalities that, just pop your name down there. Uh, is there any other help required or notices to highlight for the kind of Christmas period? Do you feel free to mention that? Oh, that's a good good problem to have. Wow. So last minute, if you want to get in and bring a friend to the wreath event, you've got, you've got two spaces. Great, that's encouraging. <laughs> um, 
Uh, let me, why don't I just, there's a lot happening, let me pray about that and then we can move into our service together. Father God, a lot of these things are new for us, Father, we haven't yet uh, organised and uh, mourned uh, a death of, at Hope Church yet, and we haven't yet had a chance to proclaim the good news of Jesus through the funeral and to show love to the mourners. Uh, and also we haven't yet organised Christmas ourselves as a Hope Church family, this is the first Christmas proper. So we pray for your help. We are conscious there's a lot on and a lot of us are mourning Don's death and um, conscious of the busyness of Christmas. So we do pray for your Holy Spirit's strength and help. But we pray also, Father, we do long to see people who don't yet trust in Jesus turning to him and believing in him. And we realise that our efforts are so small that there's nothing we can do to change people's hearts, that only you can do that by your Holy Spirit. So please work as the good news of Jesus is preached at the funeral and through the Christmas events. Please work to draw people to faith in Christ. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this morning we begin a new series of three sermons in the New Testament book of Titus. You might not have heard of that book, but it's one of the three New Testament letters, which is specifically written to church leaders rather than to church families, but which has great application to church families like ours. So let's pray um, as we start, not just for today, but for our time over the next three weeks as we look at the whole book of Titus to be spiritually profitable. So let's pray together these words from an Anglican collect. Blessed the Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Help us so to hear them, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that through patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and forever hold fast the hope of everlasting life which you have given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, we've just prayed there that we might embrace and forever hold fast the hope of everlasting life given to us in Jesus Christ. And that theme is introduced right at the start of the book of Titus. So Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now at his appointed season he's brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Saviour. From a human perspective, eternal life seems impossible for us because we're human. We see death all around us, sadly. But God has promised eternal life to all who trust in Jesus Christ. He does not lie. Do you believe God when he says that? In the last line of the Apostles' Creed, we say together, I believe in the life everlasting. And so when we say that, we're saying, yes, I believe that God doesn't lie, that he has a promised eternal life, and I believe myself in Jesus, and I will receive eternal life. I have received eternal life from him, and will enjoy that forever. So if you believe that, do stand if you're able, and we'll say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under conscious Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, for the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Do you stay standing? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let's sing our next song together. in one of these 
that the pilgrims sat down to rest and soon fell asleep. But as a side effect of the unusual grapes they had eaten, this proved to be the most extraordinary kind of sleep in which they were able to continue talking to one another even more freely than they'd been doing before. When they woke up refreshed from this wakeful sleep, they had only one aim, and that was to reach the city, the place which had filled their thoughts and dreams all through their long and often dangerous journey. So they got up and started walking towards it. On the way, two angels stopped them to ask them where they were from and what had happened on their journey so far. The pilgrims told them and one angel answered, you have only two obstacles left between you and the city. Come. Then he and his companion led Christian and Hopeful along for a while. When they stopped, the pilgrims could see very clearly the obstacles in their path. One was the heaven heavenly gate, which was firmly shut, and the other between them and the city was a wide, deep, fast flowing river. There was not a bridge or a boat in sight, and Christian and Hopeful were just wondering how they were going to get across, when one of the angels said, you have to go through the river to reach the gate. The pilgrims looked down at the water in dismay. Christian felt especially gloomy. Isn't there another way, he asked. Not for you, was the reply. Is the water the same depth all the way across? Hopeful asked. No, said one of the angels, but I can't tell you more than that, except to say that you'll find the water shallower or deeper according to your trust in the king. Can you see that, little ones? Yeah. So, there was nothing else for it. If the pilgrims wanted to reach the gate, and they certainly did, they would have to go through the water. Down the bank they went and stepped into the river. It was very deep. Hopeful found his footing quite quickly. But Christian didn't and shouted out in panic, I'm sinking! I'm going to have to wait for the next installment. <laughs> 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 to a time where we confess our sins to God and we take time to do this every week that we meet together as a church. One of the most common mistakes that people make looking in from at the outside of the Christian faith is that they assume that if God is there then surely the good deeds they've done, the moral behaviour will earn God's favour and secure eternal life. Is that, if that's what there is. And that might be you here this morning. But those of us who are Christian believers can make a similar mistake too. We may not think this in our heads, but in our hearts, we can often feel more confident to approach God in prayer after we've had a good week in our eyes, where we've obeyed God better than usual. Or maybe... We've been serving faithfully in an area of church life for a long time, or making progress in godliness, or keeping ourselves from a particular sin which has been uh, hounding us for a long time. And so the danger is that we can become proud of our track record and self-confident in the way we relate to God. And the Bible brings us back down to earth with a big bump. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. 
We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. I'm now going to read a section from the Anglican Church's Book of Homilies, which is kind of an official uh, book of sermons produced by the Church of England back in the 16th century. And this section comes from the second sermon. It's all about how impossible it is for our good deeds to make us right with God. I'll read this and then I'll invite you to join the responses on bold, in bold, which will come in, up on the screen. Let us all, with mouth and heart, confess that we are full of imperfections. Let us know our own works, how imperfect they are, and then we shall not stand foolishly and arrogantly in our own conceits, nor think we can obtain justification by our merits or works. For truly there are imperfections in our best works. We do not love God so much as we are bound to do with all our hearts, mind and power. We do not fear God as much as we ought to. We do not pray to God but with great and many imperfections. We, we give, forgive, believe, live and hope imperfectly. We fight against the devil, the world and the flesh imperfectly. Therefore, let us not be ashamed to confess the state of our imperfection plainly. Indeed, let us not be ashamed to confess imperfection even in all our best works. So, brothers and sisters, let us stay with David. We have sinned like our fathers. We have done wrong and acted wickedly. And let us all make open confession with the prodigal son to our father and say with him, we have sinned against heaven and against you, O Father. We are not worthy to be called your children. God is amazing. Uh, he both humbles the proud, so if we are self-righteous, he brings us down to earth with a bump. But he also exalts the humble. If we confess our sins, if we feel burdened under the weight of our sins, he lifts us up before him with joy as his children. Our deeds can never earn God's good favour. The only thing our deeds merit for us is hell, God's judgment for our sin. But God does not treat us as we deserve. Titus chapter 3 verses 4 to 5 say these stunning words. When the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. It is a wonderful thing to be loved unconditionally. It is a wonderful thing to be loved regardless of what you've done or not done, and even in spite of it. We know that, hopefully, from our experience of good human relationships. But how much more with God? It is a wonderful thing to experience and know the deep love of Jesus as a Christian believer. So let's stand and sing of that love now. Do stand if you're able.
reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 7, starting at verse 13. It's on page 972 in the Church Bibles. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick graves from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognise them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from you, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine who does not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. Sunday, the 19th of November, is the second Sunday before Advent. Christmas will soon be upon us. I'd like to start our prayers with the collect for today. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son was revealed to destroy the works of the devil and to make us children of God and heirs of eternal life. <coughs> Grant that we, having this hope, may purify ourselves, even as he is pure. That when we shall appear in power and great glory, we may be like, made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A prayer for the King and Parliament. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech you to bless our Sovereign Lord King Charles, Parliament, and all those who are set in authority under him, that they may order all things in wisdom, righteousness and peace, to the honour of your holy name and the good of your church and people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A prayer for the church and the people. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone worked great marvels, send down upon our bishops and clergy and all congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace and that they may truly please thee. Pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. <coughs> Grant this, O Lord, for the honour of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Before we pray for peace in the world, <coughs> I'd like to read a few words from Psalm 46. 
This psalm was written by the Korahites, who were the sons of Moses' cousin. Psalm 46, verses 8 to 11. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. A prayer for the peace of the world. Almighty God, from whom all thoughts of truth and peace proceed, kindle, we pray, in the hearts of all people the true love of peace, and guide with your pure and peaceable wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth that in tranquility your kingdom may go forward till the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sunday the 19th of November is also celebrated by some churches as Safeguarding Sunday. That is, when churches will reflect on where they may have got things wrong in the past, think about how they are supporting those who have been hurt and celebrate all the good work that is being done to protect vulnerable people and to create safer cultures and communities for everybody, both now and in the future. A prayer for safeguarding Sunday. Loving Father God, we come to you in the knowledge that you hold all your children in unconditional love. We lift to you those who are vulnerable and in need of protection. Give them your safety, comfort and peace. We cry to you for those who are hurting and whose trust has been broken. Give them your healing, restoration and justice. We bring to you those who seek to forgive others who have hurt them. Give them your strength, courage and hope. For those who have caused your children to stumble, lead them to seek your forgiveness and to enter into true repentance. Thank you for all who give their time, knowledge and skills to make our communities safer. Give them your wisdom, guidance and grace. For ourselves, we ask you to give us your heart for the vulnerable, the oppressed, the voiceless and the forgotten. Help us to see them as you see them, to value them as you value them, and to nurture and protect them as you desire. Help each one of us to play our part in creating safer places for all your people. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. And finally, before we join in the Lord's Prayer, a prayer to remember the faithful departed. O eternal Lord God, who holds all souls in life, we beseech you to shed forth upon your whole church in paradise and on earth the beams of your light and heavenly comfort, and grant that we, following the good example of those who have loved and served you here and are now at rest, may at last enter with them into the fullness of your unending joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We join together in the words taught to his disciples by the Lord Jesus. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
So we're going to look at Titus, as we said, but I'll start with a prayer. Uh, may God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour give us grace and peace this morning. Please further the faith of your people gathered here together at Hope Church this morning and our knowledge of the truth. And may we grow in godliness to live for you, trusting in your promises. Amen. Amen. So, bless you, Titus. It's a letter, firstly, and it's an old letter. Old letters can be fascinating. Sometimes you can work out what they're about, um, but not who they're from and to. So there's a charity group in Edinburgh um, recently found a four-page love letter inside a book um, that they were they've been given uh, from 1864. But there's no there's no way of knowing whether the person it was given to was it slipped into the book as a gift and then they never opened the gift. Was it kept lovingly for years? There's no way of knowing. Um, or who wrote it. Sometimes it's clear who the letter's from and to, but when you read the contents, you don't have enough context to understand just what's going on. There was a letter earlier this year, someone in um, South London received a letter just through the post that had been posted in 1916, and then it got lost in the sorting office, and eventually when it was found, Royal Mail just said, well, we better do it. Um, the recipient decided that they'd open it even though it wasn't addressed then, given the stamp, having whichever king it was back in 1916. And um, there was a letter, it was starting for help. It started with the intriguing sentence, My dear Katie, will you lend me your aid? I'm feeling quite ashamed of myself after saying what I did at the circle. But never says what it was. <laughs> yeah. So we know who it's from, we know who it's to, but we don't know how she embarrassed herself. We don't know whether Katie was able to help her. What? It just when you get one side of a conversation, sometimes that's a that's a challenge. But with the letter that we're going to be reading today, um, written by Paul to Titus, much longer ago, two thousand years ago, uh, we do we don't know much about Titus, but we do know it, we can work out all we need to know about the context about. Um, what it means. We know about Paul. Uh, Titus is an interesting character because he doesn't appear in Acts, but he does appear in the letters. So whether he was a, with Paul at times when Luke wasn't, or whether he's just someone that Luke didn't really want to feel like mentioning much, uh, we don't know. But he was around quite a lot. He supported Paul. He was one of his messengers um, that went and helped other churches when Paul wasn't there. Uh, he's in quite a lot of the letters. He's a Gentile believer. He wasn't circumcised unlike Timothy who was. And we work out from, as you read Titus, it's quite clear that Paul and Titus have been on Crete, on the island of the Mediterranean, not on holiday, um, but planting and strengthening churches. And Paul has left, but he's left Titus there with a job to do. But when did Paul go to Crete? It's another mystery. It's presumably after Acts finishes, when Luke leaves Paul in Rome, and then maybe, he was released, he went on for more missionary work. But at some point, Paul went to Crete uh, with Titus and left Titus there. And we're going to read the first chapter. And in this first chapter, you get what the reason is for writing. Paul makes it completely clear why Titus is to stay there. Um, can someone mention what the page number is on the Bibles we've got? We've got Titus. 1061. 1061. So it's at the back. You get all the T's together. You get. No, sorry? 1198, apologies. So if you're in the Bible, which is different numbers, it's not a lot of help. Yeah. So 1198, so you get all the T's at the back, you get 1 and 2 Thessalonians, you get 1 and 2 Timothy, and then you get Titus. So they put all the T's together. And we're going to be reading Titus chapter 1. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll just take a chapter at a time, and we'll see what we can get out of this letter from 2,000 years ago from Paul to his friend and co-worker Titus. Everyone there? Let's go. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Saviour. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. 
the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those in the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gut gluttons. This saying is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit doing anything good. So it's quite clear from that what Titus's mission is. Did you spot that in verse 5? I left you here on Crete so that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So whenever they'd been in Crete together, Paul left Titus to finish off, to straighten out, to put in order what they hadn't finished off yet. Presumably to complete the church planting and strengthening work they've been doing together. And which Paul wasn't completely satisfied with at the point when he left. And as part of finishing off that work right, so that the churches could be safely left, appoint elders in every town. Those were the two parts of the job. Finish it off, although it's really one job. Appointing elders was part of making sure that they'd finished off and straightened out what needed straightening out. And then in verse 6 to 9, we've got a description of what elders need to be like. How do you choose? How do you know whether someone will make a good elder or not? And then in verse 10 to 16, you get some of the problems that the new churches in Crete were facing. And I'm going to, um, and usually I'm going to work backwards through the chapter. So I'm going to start with the problems in the church that Paul needed, to, Titus needed to tackle. Because that section, verse 10, that starts with... Um, for there are many rebellious people. It's, it's therefore, because, the point is because this is the reason why you need to appoint elders. So the biggest problem was the people, as it usually is in churches. Um, people were Paul describes as rebellious, full of meaningless talk and deception. Full of talk, teaching in the churches, but the content of their teaching is so destructive that they must be silenced. Already whole households have been disrupted. Now we might expect him to say, Titus, I want you to go and tell them where they're wrong, dispute with them, debate with them. Treat their ideas with respect, but explain why, why they're wrong. But no, he's got to silence them and rebuke them sharply, because their ideas are so poisonous, which doesn't sit well in the world we're part of, does it? The idea that anything, any idea should be silenced, well, actually, we're, we're moving now to a time when inventive ideas should be silenced in our culture. Is the more the culture, but we're moving out of a time where anything goes, really. And if that's what you sincerely believe, that's what you believe. But this seems very hard line. And right up to the minute, silence them, rebuke them sharply. It's not tolerant, though, is it? It's not loving. Especially that line about Cretans being liars and evil groups and lazy gluttons, which I'm guessing he said with a bit of tongue in his cheek, he's just been on Crete, he loves the people in the Cretan churches. I'm sure he's not saying all Cretans are like this, but he's saying there are elements of the character, the culture in Crete that are not good. But some would say that that's miles away from the loving, accepting 
nature of Jesus. And there's plenty who say, well, that shows just how far Paul was from Jesus' heart. That Jesus was full of love, he welcomed, he accepted all who came to him. Paul said this sort of thing. He said, you've got to silence them, you've got to drive them out of the church, don't let them speak, and put them in opposition to each other. This week, um, Church of England had a synod, and the Archbishop of York said um, in his address, in my leading of the church, where there's conscientious and godly disagreement, I choose to err on the side of generosity. To err on the side of generosity, to err on the side of mercy. When I'm in doubt, I seek to judge the tree by its fruit. Which sounds much more Christian, doesn't it? Than what we're reading from Paul here to Titus. It's a much more comfortable approach when we're constantly told we need to be accepting and welcoming of others. And that to do so means not challenging them in this way. But that's why I had Margaret, um, thank you Margaret, read Jesus' teaching earlier, where he's, we saw him giving similarly stark warnings, as Paul does here. He also looked to judge the tree by its fruits. So that's where that phrase comes from, from Matthew 7. But he warned his disciples to be much, much more discerning in what fruit they're to look for. Some of those who come in his name, who call him Lord, Lord, are ferocious wolves, false prophets, Jesus said. If they said up front they had a better message, they didn't follow Jesus, they didn't listen to him, they wouldn't get far in the church. But Jesus says it's going to be far harder to tell them that. People will claim they know me, they will perform miracles in my name. They will say all the right things. They think they know Jesus. They think they're on the right path. They are genuine. And yet the true mark of whether or not they're his isn't what they say or how popular or powerful they are, but whether they do the will of the Father. That was in Matthew 7. Whether they actually know Jesus at all. He says, I never knew you. Whether their attitude to hearing his words is that of the wise builder, who puts them into practice, building on a solid foundation. So in this case, the Archbishop of York is just plain wrong in the context of what he's talking about. He's looking for fruit in the lives of those who are hearing Jesus' words and refusing to obey them, in saying that doesn't mean what it seems to mean, who are choosing to decide for themselves how they're going to live their life. Jesus says, however good that house looks, however much, how good the fruit looks to eat, if the foundation isn't sound, it will collapse when the storm of judgment comes. Yes, he's right, we should always err on the side of mercy and generosity where there's genuine uncertainty. But when the confusion is caused by those disobeying the clear words of Jesus, living in defiance of the clear will of the Father. The role of a bishop is not to err on the side of mercy and generosity, but clearly and humbly to rebuke and discipline those causing that confusion, as Paul tells Titus to, because they are wolves. Every bishop promises at their consecration to banish and drive away all erroneous and strange doctrine contrary to God's word. Here in Titus 1, we see why and why that's in the service. Because not only are the false teachers ruining old households, but their behaviour, verse 16, is denying God. Whatever they say with their lips, their behaviour is denying God. Whatever they claim, their minds, their consciences have been corrupted. They can't reason logically. And they're able to call evil good with a clear conscience. They're able to act against God and not feel the pain. This cor corruption comes because they've consciously rejected the truth. That's verse 14. And they've instead gone after Jewish myths, so that would have been various things they picked up from, um, from the synagogues, uh, from the traditions, and merely human commands, things that had no basis in Scripture in God's Word. From the very first in the garden, Satan didn't openly challenge God's rule. But he subtly asked Eve, did God really say? And that seed of questioning 
as it grew, turned into a rejection of God's clear word until both Eve and Adam had rejected the truth about God and believed the lie. And these people are following in their footsteps. The devastating summary of the results in the lives of these false teachers on Crete is verse 16. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for doing anything good. But if that was how they appeared to the people, to the Christians in the churches on Crete, that they wouldn't get very far. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. They're being given a platform in the church to spread their lies and encourage others away from the truth, away from life away from godliness. That's why Titus is to tackle them so strongly. But he can't be everywhere at once. So that's why the job Paul's given him, the pattern to keep churches safe from destructive false teaching, is to appoint elders in every town. That's why we need godly elders. Now I made that my title today, why we need godly elders. So it sounds a bit like I'm trying to justify my role in Hope Church. But I think that's what this passage is about. And the criteria that you get set out here to select elders is in verses 6 to 9. I'm not going to go through each of those criteria. You can um, read them, work through them, but they fall into two main groups. Most of them are saying the elders the Titus must choose. They must be displaying a godly character in their lives, one that's apparent to all. It's how they live that matters which is the contrast to the false teachers who are managing to live a life that denies the gospel they're saying, they're preaching. In their own lives, they must have a godly character, but also in the way they manage their families, because leading in the church is similar to leading in a family. And then in verse 9, the other essential criteria to complement a transparently godly character is that their grasp of the truth of the gospel, the message they need to teach, must be firm because their responsibility is to teach it clearly, to encourage the church and refute those who oppose it. They're to be able to teach positively and negatively as needed so as to build up the people of God. That's basically the two things you need to look for in a teacher, in an overseer, in an elder, in a church. Godly character and right doctrine and able to apply that positively and negatively. So our friends who remain at St Oswald's are currently interviewing candidates for a new minister. So when they go through and they write up, this is what we're going to look for in an interview, this is what we're going to find out, and this is the same for any church, Paul says, whatever other criteria you look for, these are the non-negotiables. Does the life of the candidate wholeheartedly commend the message of Jesus? Are they faithful and loving to their family if they have one? Are they generous and hospitable? Are they self-controlled, disciplined, holy? Are there any areas of their life that would bring the message into disrepute? In short, do they show evidence in their lives of the fruit of the Spirit? Do they show evidence that they're listening to Jesus' words and putting them into practice day by day, whether anyone's watching or not? And then their doctrine. Do they have a clear grasp of the Gospel message? Can they clearly explain it and teach it in ways that will encourage and build up the church? And will they courageously and lovingly challenge, rebuke and silence those who undermine and teach against the gospel? Those are the two things to be looking for in that process of appointing a new minister or appointing a new elder. Why does all this matter so much? It's quite, um, it's quite aggressive. It's called picking fights, isn't it? Why can't we just get along and agree to disagree? We've touched on some of the reasons why ensuring the gospel message is clearly taught and those denying it silenced matters already. But the underlying reasons are in the first three verses. Ben read some of them earlier. Paul lays out what is at stake. So we'll look at them now. He describes himself first as a humble servant of God and an apostle or a messenger of Jesus Christ. And he's been given the mission of furthering the faith of God's elect, God's chosen people, that's all believers, and their knowledge of the truth, truth that leads to godliness. Because you can't have one without the other. You can't have godliness that isn't based on truth. And you can't have truth and understanding and knowledge of the truth that doesn't result in a changed life. 
the two have to come together. Something's gone wrong if you think one is there but the other one isn't. It just doesn't happen. The same relationship you get with the parable of two builders. If you build your house on the rock, you need to both hear his words, which is growing in knowledge of truth, and put them into practice, growing in godliness. It's the same with the good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Bad tree cannot bear good fruit. You need to be listening to Jesus' words, that's the knowledge, and putting it into practice. That's the growth in godliness. So when elders are choosing, chosen, the two criteria, do they know the truth, do they live a godly life, those two have to go together. Which is the common thread back to Leviticus and to Habakkuk that we've been looking at over the last few months. In Leviticus, God called his people to be holy as I am holy. As they grew in their understanding of the truth about him, he expected them to grow in their godliness. We saw two sides to holiness there, the godliness of God, his otherness, his perfection, and the call on God's people to be holy, to emulate his character, to approach, however imperfectly and faintly, his moral perfection. And then we read Habakkuk, and we, he faced the need to recognise that God's holiness was going to work out in unexpected ways. And there was a call on him to, as he understood more of the truth about God's plans, to conform his life to God's character, to deepen his trust in him. I kind of assumed we all know what godliness is, and it, it, but it's quite a hard thing to pin down. Best definition I could come up with is, it's a manner of life that's centred on God, honouring God as God responding to him in awe and reverence and then working that out in every area of life. But I couldn't find a dictionary that said it that clearly, that's just my definition. But I think that's what it's at. It's a similar concept to living in the fear of the Lord. So a godly life for the believer is pretty closely mapped to a holy life in response to God. I think it's saying pretty much the same thing. Live your life in response to God being God and what he calls on us to do. Conform your life to his character. And the faith and knowledge of the truth, it's in verse 1, is all in the hope of eternal life, based on the promises of God, God who does not lie. So Paul's job is to pass on those promises, those promises that will not be broken, to build on them the faith and the knowledge of believers that will lead to a godly life. Because what God promises is eternal life, as we remembered several times this morning through prayers, through um, uh, through Christian and Hopeful as they're nearly at the eternal city now. I think we've got one more week to go before they get there, they'll get across the river. Um, as we read earlier uh, with Ben, what God promises is eternal life, life forever with him, as we're created to live it. Those are the stakes. So those promises must be passed on. We've got to hear the message in order to respond. Otherwise you might miss that chance the certainty of eternal life God offers. What false teachers do is they disrupt that process. They mix up the message, they corrupt it, they prevent people from hearing it. And that stops people from inheriting eternal life so they can build their faith and knowledge on that. That's why false teaching matters so much. It has eternal consequences. It disrupts that process of people being able to hear the promises that will make the difference of life or not forever. If these people were allowed to just carry on in Crete, not only they would deny God, miss out themselves on the hope of eternal life, but so would many others in the churches. And so would the next generation. And that's why they must be silenced and rebuked, because their message is leading people away from the only source of life. Paul says in verse 3, now at God's appointed season, he's brought these promises of eternal life to light through the preaching entrusted to Paul by the command of God our Saviour. It's his promise, his command, to share that promise. And these people are undermining that, they're confusing it, they're disrupting it, distracting from it. So Titus and the elders here point, must ensure what the message gets through, it goes forward. That's why they've got to silence these people. And that generation did successfully pass on the gospel message as it was entrusted to Paul, and then from Paul to Titus, from Titus and the elders on Crete, and then so on. Thanks to God's care, that message has come down to us today. 
we have it in the Bible. And so today, teachers matter just as much because our words either point you towards, as I stand up here on Sunday morning, I have the, the huge privilege, but also huge responsibility pointing you towards life and not subtly directing you away from it, which is the risk if I teach you something wrong. If what I say doesn't come from God's word, it has no power. It's just my opinion, and I might be lying about God. Last time I was up here, I was preaching on the covenants in Leviticus, and I carelessly said, people were working out how to live with God as their king. No, they weren't. God was telling them how they must live because he was their king. I just got the subject, the object, the wrong way around, and it was just sloppy and wrong. And John quite rightly pulled me up on it afterwards. And that's part of our job as elders, to make sure that what we say is always the truth, and is always helpful, and is always to build you up. And we take that seriously. What we say matters. So are we holding firmly to the trustworthy message as it's been taught, so we can pass it on to you? That's what we've been called to do. And when people and ideas arise that oppose that message, do we challenge that or do we say, I don't really want to argue here? It's easy to spot and criticise false teachers out there. I took a pump at the Archbishop of York earlier. That's, that's easy. I don't know him. He's not going to come here. He's not going to watch that video. What's much harder is doing that when it's people in our church family, people we know, people we have a relationship with. Because that is equally a part of our role as elders, for the good of all of us. So are we doing that? So please, keep us accountable. This is the how this works out for all of us. We all have a role in saying, yes, John and Ben and I are appointed as elders, but please keep us accountable to that. Please, um, please also watch our conduct. Don't excuse any drift you notice from honesty or from love or self-control. If there's any harshness, any rudeness in us, any behaviour that isn't in line with the gospel, just because we're teaching the truth, don't let that slide. The truth will always lead to godliness, so please watch our teaching, watch the fruit. And if our lives don't show evidence that God's spirit is at work, we must have drifted somewhere. And we need to be called out for it. Please do approach one of us if you have any concerns about our teaching, whether it lines up to what God says in the Bible, or about our lifestyle, whether that lines up to what a godly lifestyle should look like. Please do come to us. Our hope of eternal life depends on it, but so does the health of the whole church. And that's why we have, when we did all the setup last year of what, how we're going to, the, the boring bits of um, governance for Hope Church. That's why there's processes to get rid of us as elders, uh, ultimately. And there's even processes to remove Ben, the senior minister, if it comes to it, because we must all be held to these standards. And if we refuse correction, ultimately, we must be silenced for the good of the whole body. Because what matters is the message goes out that enables people to hear how they can inherit eternal life. And if we start to become a blocker for that rather than a conduit for it, we need to be removed from silence. That's the negative stuff, but to finish, let's focus on why this matters so much. Let's remember those great promises at the start. Back in verse two, God who does not lie promised the hope of eternal life before the beginning of time. That hope is certain, God does not lie. No one can stop God from doing what he promises, he will always keep his promises. So he says, eternal life is yours if you come to me in repentance and faith. That's the message. Jesus has done for us everything we need. So whoever we are, whatever lies in our past, we can come to him in repentance and faith. He will give us eternal life as a gift. He will welcome us as heirs with him. As if we read a bit more around the bit that Ben read earlier in Titus 3, he saved us not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. 
He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, who He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. That's the message that we're here to make sure is shared in Hope Church and in War's End. And that's why it matters so much that we get that right and that our conduct, that our, um, that our doctrine is right. That's the great message we all need to protect, to proclaim and to build our lives on. The truth that leads to godliness. So let's come before him in prayer. Lord God, you do not lie. You have promised eternal life to all those who come to you in faith. Please grow in us a desire to grow in our knowledge of the truth, in our faith, in our godliness. May we walk in the good works you've prepared for us this week. May faith, hope and love mark our lives together. In the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're now going to sing together in thanks and praise to the God who's preserved his gospel message, who's brought us safely this far, and who promises to keep us for the future until we get across that river to the heavenly city. So in the words of Timothy W. Smith, please stand if you're able to sing Lord for the Years. Please be seated. 